Welcome back to an instant reaction edition of the Night Report podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is Richie Schneiderite. Uh, we have a our first transfer portal commitment. So this came from a visitor this past weekend who we previously had highlighted uh, on the site. So if you're on there, you, you probably should know all about this kid. But for a refresher, his name is Eric Rogers. He's from Northern Illinois University. Uh, he spent the last two years there. He's a New Jersey kid. He went to Burlington Township High School in South Jersey. Um, he's a kid who, who started a lot of, uh, of ball there. Uh, I think Rutgers is taking him at a different position, though, if I'm correct. Uh, so tell us a little yes. bit about what Rutgers is getting in Eric Rogers. So, yeah, um, obviously they're shoring up the secondary. Um, this is a big get because you did lose a couple guys. You lost, um, I can't even think, geez, Christian, Christian Izian, Izian. Geez, I can't talk to that. Christian Izian at safety. So he's probably going to fill in that role. And uh, play right now, and you've lost Avery Young, so he's probably going to fill in one of the safety roles, playing right next to Igbenosin. So it sounds like you're going to have one of the tallest, like lengthiest DB secondary or safety second safety units in college football. Uh, those two guys are huge, and obviously they can play a little bit up more towards the line if need be, as we saw Izzy and do a lot uh, this past season. But uh, yeah, he played mostly corner for Northern Illinois. Uh, why he didn't have more offers out of high school? I'm, I'm still trying to figure out a little bit. Uh, Burlington Township kid. Tall, lengthy corner runs ran some decent speeds. Um, I think you actually had it in your thing uh, in your post. Uh, he had eleven eleven point one eight was his personal record for the uh, the hundred meter dash. Yeah, he, school, but he only ran track his senior year, so he was probably learning how to you know the correct form throughout yeah. the entire season. Of course, so it was basically mostly athleticism. It sounds like, um, but he did pretty good for Northern Illinois. A lot of people were asking me why was why does a South Jersey kid go to Northern Illinois. Uh, their head coach, Thomas Hammock's a Jersey guy, so that makes sense. He, he actually recruits Jersey quite a bit. You'll see Northern Illinois, offer, Illinois offers here and there. Um, he'll actually land like one or two kids, uh, I would say every other class, something like that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a really good get for Rutgers. Um, pretty early signing or signing a commitment, whatever you want to call it, because they technically don't sign per se. Now, that being said, I'm assuming he gets announced with the Chop 23 class in, uh, what is it, a week from now, two weeks? Yep. Something like that. So, uh, yeah, I think he'll be announced with that. He's close with Chris Long in South Jersey. He was hosted by Long and Max Melton, who are both South Jersey guys. And uh, just kind of shores up the secondary, like I said. And you kind of have a pretty good little pipeline going now with uh, with South Jersey. Yeah, and uh, this is a kid who, um, like you said, he's got really good size and length. He's 6'2", 185 is what he's listed at on his college profile. He also went to the high school of former Rutgers receiver Everett Warmly, who is also another guy who was helping recruit him uh, when he was in high school. Obviously, Rutgers didn't offer. He probably would have ended up here out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, this is a good piece to add to, to shore up the depth of our secondary, even if it doesn't end up starting. He's a high-quality backup. Um, and it does seem like Rutgers – might take one more defensive back, but this should almost lock up the position uh, for, in terms of transfers. The only other option it looks like would be Jaden Bellamy, who I don't know if you want to talk about what you're hearing about him. At the yeah, moment. We, we could talk about him. He obviously went to uh, Syracuse this past weekend. If, if you're on the board, you saw this info already. Uh, he went with his buddy and former teammate, Jaden Gould. Uh, the Q or Hughes, the Orange really like Gould. Uh, they really like Bellamy too, obviously. Um, hence, hence the visit. But uh, it sounds like he wants to come closer to home. That was a big reason of why he's visiting Syracuse, why he's supposed to visit Rutgers next weekend or this upcoming weekend. That's not 100% set in stone, I was told. So we're still waiting to 110% uh, confirm that. But it does sound like he's still probably going to be on campus. How hard they push for him, that's going to be an interesting one because uh, you do have a, quite a few secondary guys already. You have um, what I just said before, Max Melton. Now you have Eric Rogers, Igbenosin, Loyal, Longer Beam. Saw an Abrams back for another year. Uh, you got Carnell Davis, who Shiano's mentioned a couple times uh, in his press conferences this season. So it's it's a, it's a pretty deep group. So you don't necessarily need Bellamy, especially with Rodgers coming in at safety, who has two years left. You have Igbenosin, who has, I, I believe, three more years left. So it's going to be hard to find him that much playing time. But I guess if you if you could if you have a scholarship to available, you take him. But at yeah. the end of the day, it's not like the biggest need in the world. And it's probably the only position group besides maybe running back that you really don't need to add somebody at. It, it does seem crazy that they wouldn't take him just on talent mm -hmm. alone. And like, he doesn't necessarily need to play right away. Um, he could wait a year and just kind of learn the ropes and develop mm -hmm. his body a little bit more because I don't think he was, you know, he had the biggest 
frame coming out of high school to begin yeah. with. So I, I think it'd be crazy for Rutgers not to take him, just given the talent level and given that it would give them a connection to. I, and we've talked about how it doesn't really matter for the the parochials in the northeast in, in in New Jersey to begin with, but can't hurt to take a kid who's got a ton of talent and from one of the biggest schools and. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And his dad played here too. I, I think it'd be absolutely crazy if they didn't take him. The that's that's the thing. It. But uh, like like I said, the biggest reason apparently, like from day one when he got to Notre Dame, it just he wasn't a, wasn't making a good fit. It wasn't comfortable like uh, out there, and that's one of the biggest reasons he wants to come closer to where he used to play in Jersey, uh, his home, obviously. Uh, and what's more comfortable? I hate to say it. What's more comfortable than playing with your best friend? Like it's it's similar yeah. to the Elijah Clark Deuce Chestnut situation. Rutgers won it one didn't want the other. Now it's like if Jaden Gould goes to Syracuse, maybe maybe you just follow your buddy to Syracuse. Uh, their interim DC, they don't have a DC right now technically, but their interim is Nick Monroe. He's their pass game coordinator, DB's coach, and their lead recruiter for Jersey. So there is a little relationship there, and it wouldn't be shocking to me if they just promoted him, kind of what they just did with their OC. I think they promoted the QB's coach to OC. I could see him getting pass game coordinator to DC. So it would make a lot of sense if that ends up happening. Um, I don't think anyone should really like – think this is the end of the world if they don't land him though like i like i said i i personally like rogers better i think he's going to start from day one and he's going to be a significant uh significant contributor uh for uh ruckers yeah so a big pickup um so let's talk about the other visitors who came this weekend <laughs> for uh an official visit who were transfer portal guys uh just tell us a bit about how their visits went and what, what you heard from them so the only other uh transfer technically was uh I can't think of his name. Jeez. Joey Belgian, uh, Western Kentucky tight end. Uh, it sounds like he's not ready to make any type of decision yet. It sounds like he's going to take his time. Uh, he might take a couple more visits. He's got a couple of schools after him. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But nothing uh, nothing really progressing there. I know he did enjoy his visit and he liked it, but uh doesn't seem like anything's pretty imminent. And then uh, a couple high school kids came up and took unofficials. Uh, it was pretty cool to see uh, two Florida guys come up too, like Bo Mascow yeah. and Abram Wright. Uh, that's big for that's big for uh, just to get them those guys on campus again, especially because Mascow was hearing from schools like Michigan State pushing him. Uh, a couple other big names are pushing him, and then Abram Wright just added a Kentucky offer. So I know a lot of people are getting panicky and freaking out. And it seems like Rutgers did a great job of building that relationship and uh, formed a pretty strong bond. And it seems like they are 110 percent solid to the Scarlet Knights. Uh, Fama Touray, the guy's been on campus. It seems like every other week at this point. Uh, it makes sense with his brother here. Yeah. But uh, to get him on campus again is always good. Uh, obviously, they didn't get to see the best game in the world on Sunday, but they, they were all there in attendance. And uh, We will get into that shortly, for sure. Yeah, but uh, no uh, other transfers right now. Uh, Jonathan Kim, though, kicker, will be here next week, I'm told. And I'm told uh, they like him as a field goal guy, and that's what he wants to do. Interesting. Okay, so he's been a kickoff specialist, as we previously had talked about, and his whole write-up's mm-hmm. on the board if you want to read more about him. But he is a one of the more recent Rutgers offers. I do want to talk about... Uh, two more things, football side, before we split over to basketball. Uh, number one, because everyone's going to ask you, have you heard anything regarding the offensive coordinator from the visitors who were on campus this weekend? Yeah, I mean, if you go on our boards, they think it's that Cincinnati guy, but that, that clearly <laughs> isn't happening. He's, he's yeah. Wisconsin's tight ends coach now. Yep. Um, no, there, it's it's relatively quiet. I keep hearing Greg's just doing his due diligence. He's making sure – he knows he has to get this one right. Can't afford yep. to get this one wrong because – you're either stuck with another contract or you're stuck with another flaming hot garbage offense. So, yep. uh, yeah, so you got you to make sure this is the right hire. But it's it's been really, really quiet. He's making sure nothing like leaks out whatsoever. And I, I don't blame him. This is this is a tough one. You can't afford for that to leave your office pretty much. Like even like your support staff. I got to uh, walk around and be like, yo, you, no, don't you saw mm-hmm. nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you just, you got to keep everything on lock and he's doing a good job of doing so, but, uh, it is, it is a little maddening that they don't have an OC with signing day a week from now. And I'll play a little devil's advocate here. Shiano wants to get this role filled as quick as possible. He's not, Mm. he's not stupid. Like he knows how important it is to get it filled and probably the guys he wanted, the top of his list dudes probably were not interested or probably turned him down because you don't wait this long to fill that role if you can get your number one guy to, to kind of listen to you and come and interview and, and take it serious. I, he probably has gotten turned down quite a few times already. And this is not based on any kind of information. This is just inference. He would have filled the role quickly if his top of the list guys wanted to be here. So. Yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, I think that's, 
you see Longo going somewhere else, and I'm assuming he was probably mm-hmm. the home run hire of the group. Uh, yep. The other guy, Decker, obviously Decker went to ODU, but I don't know if that yep. was really a legitimate answer. I know I, personally, like I know I, I told you off on uh, off the pod, but I could say it now. I asked him about Rutgers. He, he he told me straight up, like, no, I haven't heard a single thing from Rutgers, but I'm, I'm flattered that people are mentioning my name. Yep. Um, Fonseca did some homework. He posted that Conlon hasn't heard from anybody. Uh, it sounds like Mike Shanahan was one of the top options, but he, we haven't heard anything from him. Uh, it's it's just super quiet. Like it, it's mm-hmm. it's almost like I said, it's almost scary a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, just it, it's just going to be like a, a news drop. It's going to come out of nowhere, and then we'll have to kind of dissect mm-hmm. it in real time and figure it out because it's probably not going to be somebody that we highlighted because almost all those guys have been spoken to by some media outlet or another. So just yeah. stay on the boards. It'll, it'll pop soon. Just keep, keep an eye on the, your Twitter feed, keep your eye on your, uh, you know, podcast feed because we'll have something right away after that happens. Um, but Rutgers did put out a new offer today to another transfer portal guy who should be familiar to a lot of fans. Uh, Paris Shand is a defensive tackle out of Arizona who Rutgers came in second with in Chiano's mm-hmm. first uh, class as the head coach. It was that really abbreviated class in 2020. Um, it came down to Rutgers in Arizona. He chose Arizona. He's been there for three years. Kind of been a rotational piece, made 11 starts over three years. Have you heard anything about him, or it just makes a lot of sense that they would circle back on him? It just, yeah, basically like what, what you just said. He, uh, They loved him out of high school. They thought he was great. They thought he was a great prospect, a lot of potential. I know he was relatively new to the game. I have to reread the, I have to reread my own article about what I wrote about <laughs> him uh, three years ago, two years ago, whatever it was. Uh, but, yeah, no, Shiano came here in December 2019. This kid visited, I want to say it was January 26, uh, 2020. So he was uh, one of Shiano's first like uh, first top prospects that he really pursued. And in the end, he chose Arizona. Uh, I believe he's not actually, obviously not from Connecticut because that's one of the prep schools. But uh, He's from Ontario. Jar- or from, yes. He's from Toronto. I was going to say, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for Rutgers to pursue another Canadian kid. They're pursuing one in the 2023 class as well in Digi Brill, Abdul, Vermont. That's Vermont, Abdul, one of the two, it's vice versa. Yep. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're going heavy, uh, on Canadian kids and it's, it makes sense. This is why uh, a lot of people were speculating Christian Valu, the quarterback might end up at Rutgers, but, uh, he's been relatively quiet too. I have to actually double check on him. Sound it like Virginia tech, but yeah, that would make a lot of sense with Brent Pry there and a couple other former Penn state assistants there. Yeah. But, uh, back to Shan real quick. It does sound like they're pushing to get him on campus real soon. Whether that happens this weekend or not, it's it kind of has to happen this weekend if you want to get them on campus because yeah. the, the whole period, it's, it's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. There's a window for transfers. They can only visit these two weeks, these two weekends, or they have to visit mm-hmm. in like this really quick, like two period, three day period thing in January. And that's it. Rest is dead period. So I, I don't know who came up with these rules, but the NCAA needs to hire new refs. They need to hire new oh portal gosh. guys. They need to hire a bunch of stuff because this is just the biggest mess I've ever seen in this. It's killing high school recruiting. I know when people won't admit it, yep. maybe some people will, but it's it's basically killed it at this point. It's disgusting. But you'll see more of these prep schools start to get more kids because now they're going to get the leftover, or not even the leftover. These are going to be high D1 guys. And you've seen it time and time again where, you know, Rutgers was offering, you know, walk-on spots to certain kids who ended up at the Hunt School or Petty School, and then they end up being, mm-hmm. like, blow-up recruits. I think there's a kid from Ogun the Hunt that ended up in Oklahoma – like yep. these kids end up developing because I mean they might have been new to football and they've been in a weight room for a year. Now they're added thirty pounds of muscle and they actually look like a lineman rather than like you can envision a lineman around them. Exactly. And it's also you know a lot of these kids end up who would be like the the, the signing day surprise back in the day for Rutgers or for a Power Five school are now ending up at the FCS level and or the the Group of Five level and they end up being mm-hmm. way better than anticipated because. It's like about a 20% cutoff in terms of the size of high school classes. And that 20% grouping is now going at lower levels. And, and that's why you can't write off these, these transfer portal kids that they play at a lower level because a lot more talent is going to the lower levels of football than ever before. So, Yep. Uh, speaking of which, I found the article, by the way. His senior year in 2019, his senior year, mm-hmm. Shand, that was only his second ever year playing football. So now he's played four years total of football. So he's still okay. relatively new to the game. Yeah. So something he's huge. Eye. He's 6'5", 2, 290, I believe, is what he's listed at. So he's a big boy. Yeah. You're not um, going to get that um, many other places. <laughs> no, definitely not. 
Um, so speak, you kind of alluded to it a couple times. Let's talk about the basketball game from last night. Uh, the Garden yeah. State hardwood classic. Uh, Rutgers fell to Seton Hall, 45 to 43. The the front office guys said it's going to be a rock fight, and it ended up being a rock fight. I can't yeah. remember an uglier game the last couple seasons. I guess I can. There wasn't an uglier game this season, at least, for Rutgers. Um, they only scored 43 points. They only allowed 45 points. But this was a game that S- Seton Hall, you got to give them credit. They had a great game plan for this game in terms of how to defend Cliff, in terms of how to stifle our offense. Uh, Rutgers turned the ball over uh, 19 times. They only scored 43 points. They shot mm-hmm. 32% as a team, although they did shoot pretty well from the line. They just couldn't get anything going on offense. They had so many passes that were either just like doomed from the start because they were terrible passes or guys just could not hold on to the ball in the key. You rewatched it this morning. What did you see in this game that really just like scratched your head? Pain. <laughs> everything everything was just like it was brutal to rewatch this morning I, I only watched the condensed version this morning because i couldn't put myself through it again uh but the one person in the entire game scored double digits like the offense yeah. on both sides was just brutal whether that be the three-point attempts whether it be the late game attempts um there, there's just so many things that, I, that went wrong hyatt smoked the like three-footer I know mm-hmm. people don't consider it a layup, but that's that's basically a layup. Like it was like pretty close to the. I think he was on the block actually. Um, that was a bad one. Uh, you need a shooter. You need a guy that can close the game out and shooting wise. Because like there's, I, I said it to you through text this morning after rewatching it. Paul Mulcahy crossed up the one Seton Hall defender pretty bad to the point where he stumbled backwards a little bit. Mm-hmm. Any like a, like a Geo Baker's taking that shot immediately. Yep. And that's that's what they lack. They don't have like a shooter like that. And then instead, what Paul does is he starts dribbling around a little more, and then he takes like a weird contested fadeaway shot from like the mid range, and that didn't go in. Cliff got boxed out by three dudes, so I don't really blame him in that regard. And then you get the rebound, and Hyatt just smokes it. So it's like that. Yep. That was questionable. Um, the game plan towards the end of the game too. I know you don't have like a true knockdown guy. But like the, that, your go-to like move or your go-to play for to win the game is a high a high screen with Cliff pick and roll, and it's like that's yep. not going to work when Cliff's getting bodied by fucking six six and Defu. Yep, and it's just like it's they could collapse on the paint because they know what Cliff is like. Cliff struggled too, mightily struggled. Um, that was not an NBA performance from an M- or perspective NBA uh, draft prospect or whatever you want to call it. That was that was really bad from him today or yesterday. Yep. Um. There's just the, the lack of offense is just – it's insane. And then Derek Simpson had a really bad game again. Um, so I don't I don't even – like, I like Derek. I think he's going to be really good. He's not ready for the spotlight yet. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of – like, a certain reporter online was always saying how he should have been a four-star. Rival sucks. 247 sucks. But, oh, hey, yeah. well, we, we can put tweet you again if you want. But <laughs> um, you also said Reaver was a starter, and he didn't do – he had that one weird, really, really weird fucking – with the shot clock winding down shot that just went in perfectly. And I was like, holy shit, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Rutgers, I, I thought that was another surprising element to this is that they were getting into the last few seconds of the shot clock way more than I can remember the rest yeah. of the season. Like they had a shot clock violation on a wide open three that, uh, mm-hmm. that Hyatt hit, which was unfortunate. <clears throat> um, I, for some reason, they're just terrible at the loose ball drill. How many times a game does Rutgers lose that oppor- lose out on that situation? I feel like they're losing like three quarters of all loose balls to the opposing team, which just leads to these wide open looks from like the corner or just like these wide open dunks. Like Rutgers needs to get better at securing the basketball in uh, loose ball situations. Cam yeah. Spencer, I want to circle back to really quick because he's really struggled with the last four games. He's only averaging five points per game. He's three for fourteen from from three. In that period, that's only 21%. I don't know what it is that he hasn't shoot, shot a foul shot either in the last four games. He's just not getting the looks that he previously was. Um, wow, I just noticed that too. Holy shit. Uh, I still think he's a great player, but there's just something that has to change with his game um, moving forward into Big Ten play because, I mean, the guys are going to be about the same size that we've seen in the last four games. He's, he's going to continue to be at a, a size disadvantage, so he's got to figure out a way to actually get some shots up. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people keep saying, like, you can't do it at this level. This is proof, proof, proof. No, it's just a shooter slump. Like, and he actually yeah. did pretty good against uh, Ohio State. He didn't shoot yeah. a lot of threes, but he went five of eight. Like, he had a pretty solid game. It's just a matter. And then he actually looked pretty good as a, a facilitator against Ohio State, too, mm -hmm. yeah. which is something we haven't seen since or like even in between. Like, he's been relatively quiet, like I said. Uh, like you said, he's been struggling. He'll bounce back. I'm not too concerned about Cam. I, I know Cam's a great shooter. I think he'll figure it out. It's just a matter of, I, I hate to say, it, you got to keep shooting. That's it. Yeah. Like, and no one else on this team can really create their own shot, it seems like, too. Like, yeah, Mag hit a three, but it was like a wide open three in the corner. And they yeah. found it. They just left him. They were kind of like, go ahead. You can shoot yep. it. Have fun. Like, everyone else just wasn't making anything. Caleb's offensive game was a struggle. He took another late game mid range shot too, and I I hate the mid range personally. I know Caleb's decent at it at times, but it's just like the it's the worst percentage shot in basketball. It's a proven fact. It's not good. Yeah, there was a, a, a shot that he took in the game that I thought was probably the worst shot of the game, where he he catches the ball. He has he has an open look for three, but he takes like one dribble in and he shoots it and from shoots like it. you know yeah. you know twenty one feet away. Um, and yeah, I, it's just. A rough look, man. Like this was this is a and this is a down year for Seton Hall. They don't look yeah, good whatsoever. Really bad. Like they're they're struggling this year. They just got they, they struggled against the D two team like last week. Yeah, I know they ended up winning by like twenty something. But if you saw that game, like they struggled and they got blown yep. out the week before that. They lost to Siena. Like this was a bad year. This was just a bad bad game. And I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Pike was asked like if there was any kind of like hangover from the Ohio State game, um, mm -hmm. then blowing it late. And he, he, I think he alluded to, like, you know, he would hate he would hate to say no because he thinks there was a little bit of a hangover. Um, mm -hmm. And the end of this game also had some controversy where it was clear as day that the, the Seton Hall uh, player at the, at the baseline stepped out of bounds with probably two and a half seconds left. It should have been Rutgers ball at the baseline. And they missed that, like, Danny Breslauer said it on Twitter, that has to be a reviewable play in under 10 seconds or under, under even two minutes in college basketball next season where a coach can, I don't know if it's a challenge or if it could just go to the the, the, mm -hmm. the, the monitor where if it's clear that there was a guy who stepped out of bounds, it should be triggered by the officiating group that we, we need to take a second look at this because this is now two games in a row where the officiating wasn't the reason we lost this game like it was in Ohio State, mm -hmm. but it should be something that Rutgers shouldn't get screwed by at the same time. Yeah, it's it, that's that's a big issue. They got to do something with that. I know. I think the NBA has a challenge thing now, right? That you can I think so. Call. Yeah, I, I don't recall ever seeing people do it, but I know it's definitely a thing. Um, this this team needs to bounce back quickly if they want to have any shot at the tournament. Like this is two yeah. quad three losses. That's not uh, and Temple doesn't look like they're doing too hot either. So it's like they might turn. They probably won't turn because it's a neutral site game, but they're they're on the on the border of a. Uh, being a what do you call it on a Q three a Q uh yeah what did you say Q Q three Q four loss like if they're at the one ninety four mark right now for net uh if it's two hundred one it's a it's a quad four loss and even that's what at, that's what even at a neutral site yeah neutral sites uh one hundred one to two hundred three two hundred one to three fifty three is four damn and that's you can't afford that like that's what happened last um, year and that's why they got to play in after having a nineteen win season yeah you need to step up like it's Oh, they just lost to UPenn by, by 20. Yep. Okay, never mind. That's even worse. But, yeah, it's yeah. – uh, you got to get 9, 10 wins in conference at least. And you got to win out your out-of-conference, which Wake Forest is no pushover. No, they're not. They're 7-3 right now. Um, they're going to be playing on Saturday, I believe, at noon. This is, this, mm -hmm. you know, this is a game that after, after we beat uh, Indiana, we were kind of like, I think, riding a little high. We, we mm -hmm. saw at least two of the next three as wins. You know, we, we should have won against Ohio State. We got screwed. But at this point, Pike needs to just get his guys mentally in the right space for, for Wake Forest because this is a game that Rutgers needs to recalibrate, and it's a must-win game. Like, this is a, a team that if you're building a resume to make the tournament, this is a game you must win. Because yeah. outside of Bucknell and Coppin State, they have a tough sledding of things coming up in the Big Ten schedule, starting at Mackey, playing Purdue, number one team in the nation, so they need to really get themselves right in the next few games. Yeah, it's, I, I keep rewatching. I my my cousin's a Seton Hall alum, so he keeps sending me all these fucking videos. Oh god! But like it, the mentality thing too is the big one. Like even at the end of the game, like there's a video going like 
borderline viral of just like Shaheen trying to shake hands with like Paul and Paul just not even like giving him like the time of day. Wow. Like it's just not even giving him like I a slight look. Like he just and I get it. Paul's like super emotional when it comes to shit like this. Like the games in general. He mm-hmm. loves the game. He wants to win every game. It's obviously not going to happen, but like it's, uh, some of these like post game things, like you just gotta keep it together until you get to the locker room. Like they seem like yep. they're super dramatic, and and I get it. These endings suck. It is what it is. But this isn't the end, NCAA Final Four. Like you have to kind of yep. keep your emotions in check. And then like once the locker room, that's fine. You could do that. But in public, you have people recording shit like this, and then posting this and posting that. Um. Basically, if you read all the replies, they're all attacking him. And it's like, dude, you got to keep it in check, at least until they, until you get into that locker room. Then it's whatever. You got to do whatever you got to do. But it's going to be tough. And I think, uh, like you said, these losses have been super emotional. It's not going to help that they're too kind of controversial. One more than the other, in my opinion. But yep. besides the point, um, you got to bounce back this week. You have a whole week off now, or six days, whatever. Got to got to get back in the in the gym. You got to get some f- stuff working. You got to draw up some kind of offense. Like it's 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 been bad. Someone's got to step up. Whether that be Derek Simpson, whether that be Cam Spencer, um, I think Paul and Caleb. We kind of know what they are offensively. I don't think they're going to do much more than what they do now. Um, so I think those other guys have to step up offensively and and do something. And Cliff, you can't can't afford to miss these. You can't be being abused yeah. by a six six guy too. I like Indefo. I think he's a great shot blocker. I think he's a great defensive athlete player all around scrappy guy that you love on your team, but man, oh man, he can't be abusing the six eleven Cliff. Like Well Cliff's also got to get better at, at having situational awareness because it's the second game in the last two games the second game in the last three games where he's gotten two quick fouls <laughs> and start the game and yeah. yes Indiana it didn't hurt us because Indiana is just kind of soft in the middle. But Seton Hall really took advantage of us on the inside when Cliff was out because Cliff missed mm-hmm. you know I was surprised Pike brought him back in the game in the first half, but he had yeah. two fouls in the first five minutes. And I guess, I think in Indiana, he had two fouls in the first two minutes. Um, and the first, the one foul he took was like, they were switching off at the top of the key and Cliff was trying to, to guard a guard uh, and try mm-hmm. and shuffle along with him. And that's just gotta, you gotta let that guy go past you and, and let the help defense right. come because you're never going to stay in front of that guy. Yeah. It's just a learning thing, learning curve at this point. You have to, uh, that, that stuff you have to learn, especially if you want to make yep. the NBA, like you're, that's just like simple, basketball at this point um yeah. but the good news was is kind of good news bad news you did have a very good big recruit on campus yes so yeah, that's Harper huge Harper. yeah doing Dylan harper was on campus again if you if you didn't know you heard it after the riot squad chanted his name again mm-hmm. um he's, he's loving that i'm sure but uh yeah i, I wouldn't be shocked I, I can't keep saying i can't put a lock on it because everyone's apparently listening to like my words as gospel now i've heard the message <laughs> board, so gotta be careful with that now yeah, but uh, they have a very, very good shot. You don't go to two home games within what a week span. Yep, six day span, whatever the hell it was. With unless you're, you're pretty much like considering him, or if you're committed. Like he's not committed, so calm down there. But he's mm-hmm. he's loving Rutgers. He's been here a million times. Like at the point where I, I'm even more confident he's going to end up as a Scarlet Knight. I know Duke's the other team that's pushing the hardest. Mm-hmm. Indiana's probably a third, a distant third, but it's it's Rutgers, Duke, down here, Indiana. Is Indiana making a push? Yes, of course they are. Uh, Mike Woodson, the NBA connections, all that's going to make a push on anybody. That's why he landed one of the top guys in the country last year. Yep. But Duke is Duke is Duke. And then it's the hometown Rutgers. And I think Rutgers has a really, really good shot at Dylan still. I've been pretty adamant about this for, I want to say, like, what, it's almost a year now? Six months, yeah. whatever it was. Uh, I'm still confident. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he's had two or three more games this season. Like, he's, he's close. It's Rutgers. He gets to watch a good team. You get to watch them play against a good team. You get to watch your former brother's team. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident that Dylan uh, is still – I'm not going to put a future cast yet, but I'm pretty confident Dylan will end up with Rutgers. Yeah, and he's got to realize that, like, my mom can come to every game if she wants to, and that's not nearly necessarily possible in Bloomington or in, you know, in Durham. So I'm sure he's well aware of the, the pros and cons, and he's well aware that Pike helped his brother get into the NBA. Cause it's not like he was a huge recruit coming out of uh, Bosco his senior year. So yeah. uh, he's seen how guys can develop. Cliff has developed an offensive game, developed a new legit first round type prospect for Rutgers. So uh, it's, it's not that you can't make the NBA if you go to Rutgers. It's just about, you know, feeling hundred percent comfortable about the decision. Cause that's his ultimate goal. It sounds like he wants to be a one and done, um, which is certainly possible at Rutgers, but, we haven't That's done fine. it yet. It's been done at Indiana. It's been done at Duke. So he might just 
you know, have to be the first guy who does it. Um, and it's exactly what they need. He needs someone that can create their own shot. And he's, he's that he can see this team. He sees a bunch of guys hustling, but they're missing one piece and he wants to be the figurehead. He wants to be that yep. guy in charge of the program. And that's, that, that would be his role perfectly. Like you mm-hmm. have, you'll have mag next to you. You'll have, uh, I guess, no, it'll be two years from now. So, yeah, so Paul won't be there. Um, I don't even know who would be the guard. Well, you'd have Simpson, you'd have Gavin Griffiths, <laughs> yeah. you'd have uh, Wolfolk, you'd have Wolfolk, yeah. uh, Joel. Joel, you'd have Mag have, for one more year. That yeah. so it's not like they wouldn't That's have guys. A, no, uh, you got one of the best shooters in in the uh, Griffiths again. My my one of my guys went to see a uh, Griffiths play, or Zach Zach Smart who writes for us. Mm-hmm. He uh he went to go see him play uh, recently, and he's like, "Holy shit, man! This kid just just shoots. He doesn't yeah. do anything. He just shoots the heck out of the ball." Like. I wouldn't be shocked if his rating went up again. Like people love him. Yep. I think he's like even the the rivals national guy, uh, Travis Graff, tells me all the time. He's like, I think I got to put him higher. Like this man is just killing it. Like I know he's just a shooter technically, but like he just doesn't miss. And he's and already that's... hitting that. He's hitting that five star ceiling right now. He's I think he's yeah. right. He think he's less than ten guys below five star. So mm-hmm. it's uh, based insane. on what you're saying, you Rutgers might have their first five star potentially. Two five stars maybe. That'd be cool. Like, oh, he's just, he's so good. It's, it's ridiculous. I can't wait for the next rankings update. Cause I, I really think like the biggest knock on him, like I said, that he doesn't do anything other than shoot, but his shooting's just lights out. Like mm-hmm. it's insane. Yeah. He's 30 right now. 23 is the last five star, right. As of now, but that could change too. They might add more five stars. I was going to say, typically, isn't that around 28 to 30 guys a year or five stars? Um, last year it was 29. Okay. So, so I, just to put that so in yes. perspective. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, he's got a shot. Like he's really got a shot at being a five-star. He's just he's something else. Um, I'm intrigued to see like what yeah, he brings to the banks. In 2020, there was a uh, 31 five stars. There you go. So it's just, uh, getting closer and closer. We'll see, but uh, I'm very, con- I'm pretty confident in Rutgers here with Dylan Harper, and I think he'll be at more games. And I just got to bounce back uh, from a team standpoint, and that's that's Wake Forest on Saturday. So we'll see what happens. Uh, see what happens there. It's gonna be a sold out crowd, I believe. I think they're all sold out. At this I point. think basically every game sold out at this point. Yeah. Saturday at noon, not the best time in the world, but it's good enough. Saturday, so yeah, it'll still be a, a great crowd and. You know, just because it's not a night game doesn't mean it can't be a, a, a nice, loud, uh, rowdy group. But it certainly helped. It's true. All right, we kind of covered a lot today. I know you got to head out. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we sign off here? Um, no, I mean, recruiting coming up. Uh, big recruiting weekend. Jonathan Kim, I mentioned, transfer is going to be there. Bellamy is supposed to be there. Any recruit that uh, hasn't taken an official visit yet to Rutgers, which I think is a lot of them, actually. I think I listed it yesterday on the message board. I think it's like seven or eight of them who haven't been to campus yet for an official. So they'll all be on campus. It's going to be a big group. A um, couple uncommitted guys slash committed elsewhere. Um, Digibro, Abdul Rahman, the Canadian defensive end I told you about. Adir Chirchi, he just came back from a UConn visit. Um, he will be at Rutgers this weekend. And Chimdi Ona. Ono? Ona. Uh, Nebraska was making a big push for him, but it sounds like uh, he's going to take his Rutgers visit this official weekend. This weekend instead, Nebraska tried to flip that. That didn't happen. So now Nebraska took some uh, – I don't even know who they took. They took some kind of South Jersey kid yesterday who I've never heard of. But Yeah, his name was like uh, Quentin something from Pomona. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. He's got weird – weirdly – he's listed as a running back, but I think he's like 6'3", like 220. And it's like – it's like – Bigger yeah. than Jameer Wright Collins, and he was a pretty big back. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it sounds like they're they're a good shot at all three of those guys. Uh, Vincent Carroll Jackson was supposed to be on campus, but won't be anymore at Syracuse. He's gone. It seems like so. Uh, there's no tricks up the sleeve, so we can just nip that one in the butt. Mm-hmm. You know, who, you know who you are. I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think they finished with those three guys, and then. Uh, They'll probably add a couple transfers here and there. Well, they just added one, so we'll have a couple more probably. All right, guys. Well, stay tuned to board. Stay tuned to your uh, podcast feed because I'm sure this won't be the last instant reaction we do this uh, period. So for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report podcast signing off.